Thank you, Julian, and uh, thanks to the Sydney Mining Club for 20 years and not being here. Look around the crowd, I'm not surprised. Um, in fact, I look around the crowd and I see lots of old people, and I'm glad I made it this year, otherwise another 10 years or 20 years would be in a geriatric home giving this. <laughs> but it is also nice to see some younger people in the, in the audience, like John McIntyre. <laughs> um, also interesting to hear a lawyer present, you know, it was very, very good. And we all know about lawyers, I mean the difference between a lawyer and seaman is that one in 500,000 has a chance of becoming a human being. <laughs> and Regina, your quip about women taking it longer than men was not lost on me, although you didn't get a laugh from the audience. It was very good, Regina. The graphs you showed me looked like uh, the Metals X chart moving forward as opposed to the gold price. Um, so, he's off drinking to a brighter future. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Metals X and, and really uh, the businesses that we have at Metals X. And the topic is really three for one in a bank. And that refers to our position as the largest and only tin miner in Australia. It's great to be the only tin miner in Australia because you're also the largest. But we are a globally significant tin miner, producing about 2.5% of world mine supply from our Renison mine. Um, being a tin miner has been a tough business because we've become irrelevant. You want some more volume? Right. Thank you, Mr. Maniac. Oh, Melnack, sorry. Um, and congratulations on your award. Um, so, you know, being a, uh, being a tin miner and just a tin miner makes us pretty irrelevant. So we decided to go back to our roots a bit and get back into gold. And it's been a pretty tough market for gold, but um, you know, we found some opportunity, and that started with the consolidation of our gold assets and, uh, and our expansion into gold production. Uh, I suppose the third one, notice they're all one, one, one. No one's noticed that. I just did. I proofed this presentation really well. Developing, <laughs> developing a world-class nickel asset. And I'll tell you about this asset. It's by far the biggest and the best asset in this company. The bank, referring to our, our balance sheet, our position with plus $130 million of cash and working capital, and now having to fill the traditional role that stockbrokers and bankers have made to the junior mining sector by funding them through developments, particularly where it can make a difference to, or we can make a difference to them through our assets and infrastructure. So a quick snapshot, corporate snapshot of Metals X. Um, someone today asked me, well, your stock's up 300% overnight. I said, we did a one for four reconstruction, but don't, <laughs> Don't let that worry you. So we've brought that down to some relevancy. Our share price trades at 71.5 cents. So in Australian dollars today, we've got a market capitalisation of around 300, which is pretty damn small for a company of an enterprise value of $170 million. It's earning $100 million a year in EBITDA. Um, big year for us. We're in the ASX 300 now. Um, we've announced our dividend policy, 30% uh, of NPAT. In fact, you can buy the stock, and I expect everyone who leaves the room to go out and buy the stock. Come dividend still until the 12th of December, yielding a grossed up, it's a fully frank dividend, a grossed up yield above 5% five and a, five and above five percent. I won't go to the points. So looking in the rear view mirror, looking back at the last year, and you'd be forgiven for thinking it's been a pretty tough year for miners. For us, all the arrows have been pointing up. Return on equity has been positive. Um, and of course, through that, we also funded over $50 million of capital and exploration works. And the next year, we will fund over $60 million in capital and exploration works. And, and today, I'm pleased to say we're one of the few companies that have about 12 rigs out drilling in the industry across our different projects. So the guidelines in which we set about building metals X are pretty important. And the first is to remain relevant. And remaining relevant means We've had to get away from that special purpose metal of tin to create something that the market likes. We only work for our shareholders, and our shareholders, well, the shareholders used to buy shares to sell them at a higher price. Um, we consolidated and diversified the company, so we consolidated all our cross ownerships to build our gold division. And we stuck to our skill base. 
We can only control what we can control, and that's our costs and the way we run our business. The metal prices are irrelevant to us. That's just, that's just the cream on the top. Ignore the brokers, the analysts and the fundies. Now, that sounds like a talking statement if ever I've seen one. Because uh, they always tell you what they want to hear. Um, don't take on debt, a very, very important thing. Retain a strong balance sheet. Every mining company that I see that's under stress in this industry today is suffering under a world of debt. Um, you take your, they take, banks will take your decisions off you. You'll have a two-year-old credit guy turn up at your mine site and tell you how to run it. <laughs> He'll tell the blokes that go and live and breathe that mine every day of the week what's wrong with them. And they don't know shit. <laughs> that was for the bankers who I invited along today. <laughs> what a bunch of bankers. Uh, <laughs> grow. Let's grow our asset base without exposing ourselves to large capital risk. And that's been our model in Metals X. It's been waiting for downturns in the industry and buying assets at a fraction of their replacement costs and trying to manage those assets better and more strategically. Importantly, respecting our shareholders. We're all stuck in the lobster pot together. I can make this sound really good with respect, but the reality is most small resource companies are a lobster pot. You can get in, but you can't get out. So in terms of respecting our shareholders, we've got a strong belief that if we make profits, we need to share it with our shareholders. And importantly, knowing that the share price is our only true measure of our performance. We can go to work every day thinking we've done a wonderful job. But people buy shares at a particular price to sell them at a higher price. And that's the only measure of our performance. And with that, I'd like to say that sideways is the new up. <laughs> because in the last 12 months, certainly in the last two years, we've substantially outperformed our peers in the market by going sideways. And I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not. And we're a diversified miner, and we've made a deliberate attempt to build ourselves as a diversified miner. As the chairman says, ignore the brokers. Diversified, what does that mean? Well, these days, you look up the thesaurus, it's hard to work out what it means, but it does mean complicated. And the son of the great John McIntyre told me that. <laughs> Diversified, that's complicated. How do I add this up? How do I get it to make sense? So my chairman tells me also that 20 years ago all the strong companies in the market were diversified miners. Today they're not. Today they're special purpose companies. Because the analysts in the market, and there's not many left, uh, like it that way and they like it simple. So we've got a large resource base in base metals and in gold. There's globally significant positions in tin, nickel and cobalt. There's some diversified base metals. And of course there's four gold projects in the group for the resource base above 13 million ounces. So it's not a small resource inventory. And the revenue is diversified over two of those at this point in time, tin and gold. So in our position as a globally significant tin miner, and this is a pretty unique position because one day the tin price is going to fall off, a, or the tin supply is going to fall off a cliff, and I've been waiting for a few years now, and the tin price is going to be really high and everyone's going to run around the world looking for a tin producer to buy. Well, we are one of the very few, if not the only, publicly listed tin producers in the Western world which gives us a fairly unique position. There's three tin projects in the company, which we own 50% of. Our partner is the largest and most diversely integrated tin producer in the world, being Yunnan Tin. And that brings a fair bit of stability and some support for us. So the key mine, the key production centre is the Renison Mine, which is a world-renowned mine. A famous mine, there's probably people in this room who've worked at Renison as I speak. The Rentails project, ingenuity, some new technology, and old tailings dumps get reworked. God only knows why the Mines Department wants us to rehabilitate these and put bonds on them at $50,000 a hectare. 
because in a response to higher metal prices, these tailings dams several times in the gold industry and in base metals industry have been reworked. And of course, the Mount Bischoff mine. So the Renison mines are mining the production and uh, I can see I've proofread this because anyone who's worked at Renison knows it hasn't produced 236 million tonnes at 1.4% tin. It's actually 23.6 million tonnes, but no one would have picked that up if I didn't. Um, today it's probably got the largest resource base it's had in its history. We've invested very heavily in this mine. It's a big, grand old mine. It's not deep mine. It's 850 metres deep. Covers two k's in strike, about two k's in lateral extent. Um, reserve, it's an underground mine. People get hung up about reserves in underground mines. You know, all I can say about underground mines, and I read this in the paper last night on the plane, Bill Beamont from Northern Star talking about open pit mining in Australia being over. And our future is underground mines. And people, investors, analysts, are going to have to get used to underground mines and amortising the reserve to zero in the life of the reserve. Underground mines are like old Chevy cars, which just get faster in time. Underground mines just get deeper. Now, I suppose there's no better evidence of this in Australia than in the Central Norseman mine, which had three years of life for the last hundred years. Uh, in, a bit of a, in a bit of trouble now, but um, hundred years ain't bad. Um, so this mine is a modest earner for us. It's, we've done the best we can on this mine. Our costs are very stable. We can't do much about our costs without changing the labour laws in Tasmania and finding a way to increase the productivity from the Tasmanians, which remains about 20% below the benchmark we can do in Western Australia. So it generates modest earnings for us, about $25 million to EBITDA our share. Sustaining capex is relatively low, about, low, about $7 million a year. But for each $1,000 the tin price goes up, it's about, it's about $4 million to EBITDA added to our bottom line from this mine. The key point about this is it's, the capital is sunk. It's $300 million plus of replacement value in here, and it's in pole position to benefit from a, a higher tin price. I know we're running a little bit late today, so I'll scoot through a couple of these slides. A tin expansion project, another nice project, economically a better project than, uh, than the Renison mine itself, although a finite mine, it's an 11-year project. Our share, $90 million of capital, $28 million of EBITDA a year. It's an 11, possibly 12-year project. So why isn't this in production? Well, all I can tell you is that we now have a Chinese partner. And having a Chinese partner is like going through an apprenticeship and herding stray cats. Um, it's quite difficult to get a decision made in the time frame which we would be used to. They don't care. Because they don't care what happens in the next quarter or in the next year. They're planning 50 years ahead for their long-term mine metal supply. Not looking to trade a stock to a next quarter. So I'll move on to the second, the second side of, or the second platform in our business, our position in a gold producer. So we have four gold projects, two of these acquired by buying the Australian business unit of Alaska Gold. Uh, a few people know this story. Um, a North American company, and we love these international companies that come to Australia and can do things better than us, bless their souls, the harmonies, and I saw Craig Williams, the barracks of this world come and buy up all of our assets and try and run them a little bit better. In fact, I remember the time when Harmony took over Hill 50 and I had Bernard Swinepoel come to my office and tell me, Peter, we've been to South Africa and we've stolen the crumbs from the rich man's table. And we're coming to Australia and we'll be doing the same thing. And I said, holy shit, that's what I just did. Anyway, so bless their souls. Um, the acquisition of the Australian Business Unit of Alaska was one of those examples where a North American miner just had to leave Australia. Um, the Central Murchison and Rover projects are projects that we effectively controlled for the previous six years through 
West Gold Resources, we controlled 35 per cent of that company and we consolidated the ownership of that. Um, I won't harp on this, but you know, you can add one more night on here. So the six month spot, Australian dollar gold price versus the US dollar gold price. I just spent two weeks in North America, in the USA and in Toronto. And the Americans are all saying, oh, there's all pessimism everywhere, it's all over, because they have no hedge against their own currency. The Australian dollar gold price is flat. In fact, if you go one day forward on this little graph, the little blue line is up at 1450, up near 1450 an ounce. So for the last six months, the gold price has just gone sideways in Australian dollars. The US dollar gold price has dropped. In that same period of time, since December, December only, sorry, September only, we've seen a 40% erosion in the Australian gold index, Australian gold stocks. If their revenue, or the fundamental thing for their business, their profitability, changing. So all you brokers in the room, what are you doing? You've got to learn to sell these stocks. They're making money. Um, the Higginsville Gold Operations and the South Kalgoorlie Gold Operations uh, acquired from Alassa for $44 million. I think they presented at this forum in the past, Avoca Mining. Anatolia and Avoca merged together for $1.2 billion two and a half years ago. These goddamn lunatics sold us the two key assets for $44 million. And what's more, there's a little bit more that came with it. I bought the Australian structs. I bought a $420 million tax shelter for a dollar because we brought all of those subsidiary companies there as well. As well. Their main, the main part of these are Higginsville Operations um, and the Trident Mine, which is a great mine, and it's the classic example of old mines not dying and getting deeper. In our first year at this mine, as I said, our attributed purchase cost of this mine was $30 million. It generated $90 million of EBITDA, the 161,000 ounces of gold. It's not, it's not continuously achievable. We're benchmarking this mine at around 120, 125,000 ounce per annum level. Um, and its future really is the extension of this underground mine, a possession of open pits and some more potential. The South Cal operations, an asset, an asset we carry for $5 million on our balance sheet. A mine, a process plant that's done 100,000 ounces of gold for 25 years in a row. A mine that the previous owner decided to bulldoze and do a super pit on. Super pits are great when the gold price is high, provided you hedge the gold and guarantee your revenue. So we've changed that and we've fumbled along on this mine doing a little bit of toll processing, processing low grade stocks, but still out of that. By managing this tightly and wanting to own it, we've managed to achieve $16 million of EBITDA from this mine and fund, internally fund, all our exploration and development. And we've now restarted that big bulk low grade super pit as a small high grade underground mine, which is what it was when, when New Celebration was operating in the 90s. So I suppose the first 12 months and, you know, not trying to gloat here, but trying to say that what have we done different? We haven't really done much different, except we've given it a little bit of love. We know our patch, we know how to operate in our patch. And you can make money from these mines if you're prepared to reinvest in them and establish the contracts, the workforce, and really recognise that these are small gold mines. And what makes a small gold mine work is not the board, it's not a group of disjunctive people that spreadsheet miners from afar. It's the interpersonal relationships of the four or five key guys at that site, our mine manager, our chief geologist, our metallurgist, that make this mine work. When we brought this, we went around and we didn't say a lot here, but we went to the USA and we got laughed at, we got laughed out the door. 
We turned up and said we could do 150,000 ounces from these projects, at about $1,000 an ounce, total cash cost of sales. I call that all in sustaining cost. I think all in sustaining cost is open to more rort than the old methods. We actually did 180,000, made $107 million of EBITDA. Um, so it was a good first quarter for the mine. And uh, moving forward from these two assets, we're expecting above 150,000. It's still very profitable. Um, about $1,050 an ounce, all in or whatever you want to call it. Um, the next step, following with the theme of not exposing ourselves to large capital risk. We owned a project in the Murchison. I suppose half of some stuff that we'd owned before, before Harmony stole the crumbs off our table, the Big Bell Mine and the Cutting Warra Mines. Um, we went through, West Gold went through the normal process of a feasibility study, trying to build this project up trying to go through a banking process to fund it, only to find that it was on that treadmill of a nice 11-year project. But the first three years was working for a bank. And shareholders didn't have the patience to wait three years for some real return or some reflection of value in the company. So we put that on hold. We sat back and watched what was going on the Murchison. A big dose of patience and calmness and not trying to deliver to the what the fund managers or the brokers or the investors really want you to do for their self-serving needs. You can buy assets in here at a fraction of their replacement costs. And we did that in this scenario. We brought the Bluebird, the famous Bluebird mine from Reed Resources for $9.4 million. And they threw in a little three and a half million ounce gold resource with that as well. So for that, that gave us the opportunity to replace $120 million of capital construction costs for a new plant. 12 months, 18 months of construction time and all the other, all the other complications. With a plant that had just had about $80 million spent on it and was operating, ready to go. And for us, the catalyst to rebuild this project on an expanded basis without taking a capital risk. So it's all owned. So there's three gold plants in this company. There's a very large tin plant in this company. There's effectively $800 million of hard assets in this company. Now if we were an industrial company, we'd be trading in about 40% of our NAV just on the assets alone. And of course, the fourth project in the company, uh, the Rover project. And this one's different, because this is a virgin discovery. It's the only asset in the company that doesn't have a, a processing solution or one that be, can be stolen off some other poor sucker at a discount of its replacement cost. Um, this one requires a full new build. And for that reason, it gets deferred to the back end of this. But this is a great project. It's a great metric for underground mining. You know, if diversified miners are complicated, IOCG deposits, polymetallic deposits are even more complicated because they're even harder to benchmark. We know how everyone hates gold equivalences, but how do you talk about a polymetallic deposit on a benchmark basis without any equivalence? So this is a gold, a typical Tenon Creek gold and copper deposit with some bismuth and some cobalt in it. It's the smallest production base of anything we're planning. It's not yet at development level or development phase, it hasn't completed a full bankable study, and it's possibly going to have a shaft sunk into it as opposed to a deep one. This has got a very short strike length, and the shaft enables you to access the Bonanza high-grade gold and copper zones first, as opposed to last. Um, so where we're going with our gold division, we're trying to build this up without exposing us or our shareholders to large capital risk. So we've got two choices in a, in a market like this, in an industry like this, is to go and raise some money, go and take on a big pile of debt and pay for the things that the, the majors want to throw out, and there are others doing that. Or to live within your means and not expose yourself to that risk, to that debt or a dilution of your shareholders, and steadily build it up, knowing and having faith that you know what you're doing, even if others don't think you do. 
So our intent is to try and build this, and we have the capability to build this to plus half a million ounces of gold production on an annualised basis. Um, there's four numbers in there. Rover, I said the purple one on the top. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. You can get deferred out for as long as possible. At the moment, there's better ways to spend $100 million on a virgin build in Tennant Creek. And just finally moving on to the last asset in the company, in my mind, by far the biggest and the best asset in this company, and it dwarfs everything else, but it's valued at zero. It's valued at zero because it's a 40-year project. And we value 40-year projects and long-life projects. It's probably an 80-year project using net present value analysis. And some are even stupid enough to use a 15% discount rate to cover risk. Well, half of zero is still zero after 15 years. So there's no value attributed to most of these projects. So this is in the Central Musgraves, and we remember in the 90s we had a boom in the Central Musgraves. Western Mining built some holes at, uh, in the Western Musgraves there with some high-grade nickel sulphide deposits. And this project never, it never made it. Never made it through that boom. It was locked up. This is a project that was discovered by Inco in the 70s in the last nickel boom. And in the 70s, it was the largest nickel, known nickel deposit in the world. It's 100 million tonnes at 1.2% nickel. It got locked up in Aboriginal lands. And it was untitled until 2002, when a small exploration or a small junior from Perth managed to get land access, and that company is called a claim exploration. So we got involved in this project in 2005, and we thought it was fantastic. How good was this? Did 250,000 metres of drilling, brought the minority interests out, put it into feasibility study, and the nickel price went to $50,000 Australian a tonne. It's a limonite deposit. It's not a laterite. Now, there's a few geologists in the room who will probably know the difference, but the simple difference, and the difference for those people who don't understand, is that HPEL is a dirty word. It's a scary word. HPEL works seamlessly on every limonite deposit in the world. It's disastrous on every mixed laterite deposit in the world. And that's because of the iron content. This is an iron ore body. It's 50% Fe203 and it's 1.5% magnesium. And the process of oxidising nickel laterites is dissolving everything in acid. And of course, when you put that, that process of dissolving everything in sulfuric acid under pressure and temperature, you reverse the reaction at the end of it and you get to use the acid over and over. So that's why HPEL is the chosen, the chosen methodology for processing laterites or limonite laterites, tropical laterites. Australia's had two of these. Some might be old enough to remember the ones in Queensland, the Greenvale project. Well, were there any issues with that? The other four have been mixed, mixed laterites from the gold fields. For those geologists in the room, there's another big difference. The laterites in the eastern gold fields where we have our failed projects are formed from nickel sulphides, fine nickel sulphides, oxidised through commodiate rocks. The nickel in these limonite deposits at Wingalina are formed from the total oxidation. Oxidation by nature, complete oxidation of the mineral called olivine, which had nickel in its crystal structure. And of course, olivine's an iron magnesium silicate, and when you oxidise everything, the magnesium disappears and you're left with iron. So you can imagine this ore body and the bulk density of this ore to 200 metres deep is 1.17 tonnes per cubic metre. It virtually floats on water. So um, a very interesting ore. So look, you know, geniuses as we were, we did a feasibility study where nickel price went to 50,000 Australian dollars a tonne. These are the metrics and these are the numbers we used in the 40-year project. We used the nickel price, a long-term nickel price of $20,000 a tonne, a cobalt price of $45,000 a tonne and an 85 cent exchange rate. And we've been around the world for six years with this project, with things moving up and down. Uh, I recall 
you're going to see some brokers, and this is an asset at the time which is commanding plus $600 million of market cap in, in Metals X. Um, and being told I was a complete idiot for using a $20,000 nickel price or a 23000 Australian dollar nickel price when the spot nickel price was $50,000 a tonne. And all I can tell you is that six years on, I'm still a complete idiot because the nickel price is now down at about $18,000 a tonne and I'm still using 23. So some things don't change. Look, this is a mega project. It's, it starts with 40 years of reserves. It's got a big hurdle rate as these projects do. It's a $2.5 billion pile of cash to jump over. It's a project that will operate for 40 years and generate half a billion dollars of free cash a year for an initial 40 years. There's a lot more of this nickel out in those areas. So the state of play, play here, and I apologise for that glitch in that slide. We own 100% of this and 100% of the rights to offtake to this project. It's one of the largest undeveloped, and I think if you actually check the numbers, it's the fourth largest undeveloped nickel cobalt project in the world today. The nickel and the stainless steel markets are certainly emerging from a physical change process where they've been dominated by ferro-nickels. In fact, pig nickel. There's a boom in pig nickel and exports of pig nickel. And that's changing in the market. It's driven prices of nickel up 60% this year. But astoundingly, LME stocks of nickel have continued to go up. So what part of economic theory tells you that makes sense? Um, it's pure speculation in this market. So we believe this project will get up in the next price upswing. It'll be funded. And I'd just like you to know, we don't think we can develop this project ourselves. We're not Andrew Forrest, nor do we want to take on the debt to do this. Our objective is to try and build this project by retaining a free carried interest to commercial production. And we've signed an MOU with Samsung c and and some Korean giants on that basis about 18 months ago. And MOUs are great. They're non-binding. The lawyers are here. Gary, I take back that comment about the semen. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, that, that deal we signed left Metals X of a 30% free carry to commercial production. It needed an 18%, 17.5%, in fact, internal rate of return to be bankable in Korea. So we actually signed it just in time for the nickel price to fall totally out of bed. So it's been parked and it's fast re-emerging. But that's a great deal for Metals X. That's like someone cutting me a cheque for $750 million and handing it over. And before I could get my grubby little mix on it, snatching it back and saying, I'm going to spend that for you. And in three years' time, we're going to have a 30% free carried interest in that cash flow. So that's 30% of half a billion dollars a year for 40 years. So. I'm here speaking because I'm selling, so I'm giving you the investment synopsis in Metals X. So Metals X is a diversified miner, one of the few in Australia. It's a company that pays dividends, a gold miner that pays dividends. God help us. Um, it's got a strong balance sheet. It's got fully funded growth options in gold and tin. It's got diversified metals exposure. It's got very large metal inventory across base and gold metals. It's got that free option on that massive world-class nickel project. It's got significant share price upside and what resource company in the market today doesn't? It's well covered by research. One of the, the very difficult things for Metals X, the company that hasn't been to the market since 2009, Correct me if I'm wrong, Stuart. Five years. Hasn't been to the market for five years. Hasn't offered the brokers anything. No placements. No mandates. Very hard to get research done. But I'm pleased to say there's now eight research notes on Metals X. They all have average buy prices about twice its current trading price. I present you the Metals X story and we're proudly positioned as an Australian miner.